Now, one particularly challenging and uncomfortable moment in that narrative is the one that we celebrate today. The giving of the Holy Spirit. For centuries, the bedtime story, at least in people's minds, had been the same. Over and over and over again. It was read every Sabbath day in the synagogue. It was always the same words, and they always carried the same meaning. But then when the Messiah shows up, and he doesn't match that static bedtime story, boy, does that mess with everybody's heads. The Messiah was supposed to be a warrior king who would lead them into Jerusalem and kick out the Roman scum and return the kingdom to Israel, not a universal savior who would end it all in a dramatic act of self-sacrifice. And certainly not one who, after that act of self-sacrifice, would come back in a glorified and resurrected body. So this was already messing with everybody's heads. And then come the day of Pentecost. And all of a sudden, people of every race and language are gathered together in Jerusalem, and they are hearing not just in Hebrew, not just in the lingua franca, not just in that same old bedtime story, but in their own languages, their own tongues, their own ways of communicating God's great deeds of power. That's not the story, Mommy. That's not the story, Daddy. Come on. Get with the program. Get back and tell, me, tell it the right way. Well, there's two ways to look at this. One is the, thank goodness it's 2,000 years later. Thank goodness we're back to that same comforting bedtime story we can listen to day after day, night after night, same words, same meaning. Must have been awfully rough for those apostles back then having to change the whole thing up, but now that we've got the story right, we can make it static. You know, that's not a completely unreasonable way of looking at things. And a lot of people who call themselves Christians do. But then the other way is to say, if the story was dynamic then, if the apostles were challenged to allow the story to shift before their very eyes, to shift in words, to shift in meaning, Perhaps that's a sign that it's always that way. Perhaps that's a sign that now, 2,000 years later, we are meant to receive the story with the same degree of openness, the same flexibility of mind, the same willingness to allow it to change before our very eyes, to change us from within, and to always be of shifting meaning in this temporal world. Perhaps we're challenged to be that way ourselves right now and right here. See, there's a couple of major leaders in our church that are caught right in the middle of this tension. You can't escape noticing the current Pope, Pope Francis. He is an interesting and controversial figure, and he gets a whole lot of pushback. It's not that he is not a traditional Catholic in a lot of senses, but he is also a huge climate champion. He's very vocal on this issue. And when it comes to the issues that the church has for decades, perhaps even centuries, claimed as absolutely central points of dogma, he has had the nerve to say, it's not that we're dismissing them utterly, but in his own words, let us, church, maintain a sense of proportion. Let us look at today's world, at what is its central challenges, central in the minds of its people, and perhaps what God is calling out of us is a new and fresh way of speaking the truth of the gospel that meets that world right where it is, and therefore, by definition, must look different from the way previous generations told the story. 
Boy, that does not get received well by many people. But it gets received incredibly well by others. And our own presiding bishop, Michael Curry, is perhaps in the same ilk. He is, in some ways, taking the church out of its comfortable and familiar lane. Of his threefold vision, at least two of them strike us as pretty new. He says during his nine years, he wishes for evangelism, care of creation, and racial reconciliation to be central themes of the Episcopal Church. Well, two of those three are kind of like, whoa, wait a second, guy, this is, this is new. The church has never said that that's a major point of emphasis. And besides, it's nowhere mentioned directly in the Bible. Well, folks, a lot of things are not mentioned directly in the Bible. Jesus said nothing about the Internet. <laughs> that does not mean that scriptural principles cannot inform our dialogue about the best and highest way of using information technology. So, if we're looking at a world where things like mitigating climate change and addressing racial reconciliation seem to be front and center, if we are going to be Holy Spirit people, if we are going to be Pentecostal people, if we are going to be the kind of people who hear the bedtime story told differently tonight than it's ever been told before, and it can shed that urge to say, no, 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 put it back in the familiar box. Then perhaps we need to be open to the idea that even though the gospel story has never interfaced with the world in this way before, now that's precisely where God is asking for that interface to occur. So folks, today I'm not giving you any solid answers, but I'm simply raising a question that I hope will be open today and will always be open in your minds. Let the story be dynamic. Let the words on the page anchor you in a mystical way, but not necessarily in a way that says Goldilocks has to encounter those three bears the same way every because guess what? The bears change. The bears grow up and evolve, and so does Goldilocks. And that means every time she goes down that forest path, she's going to have a slightly different experience than she did the last time. And so let that gift of the Holy Spirit empower you, give you courage, give you strength, give you the ability to see the gospel as a fresh and new story every single day. One that is ready to meet a world that looks nothing like the world that it met yesterday, but with equal joy 